and welcome to today's webinar on Divi. And thank you for attending. I know everyone's pretty zoomed out from the whole COVID adaption. So I appreciate you being here. Um, so in the background here, we have a, a, a the photo is from, uh, it's a classic from an artist called Louis Tiffany. Um, this is from 1908, um, from the Art Nouveau period. And the image itself is out of copyright, the graphics out of copyright. However, the photo is technically still in copyright. However, the Met Museum in America has released a lot of their artwork, photos of artwork as uh, public domain and creative commons. So that's interesting, um, means that we can use them um, legally with, without needing special permissions. Okay, so I'm just going to jump to an introduction to Divi and page builders. So to me, the, the advent of Wix, um, Squarespace, Weebly, these sort of websites was a huge paradigm shift in um, web design. Bef when I first started doing web design, uh, websites were hand coded, literally the whole lot was written by code. Then we started moving into content management systems, which then allowed us to do code templates, which allowed people to, normal people to be able to add content, um, but the actual design still needed to be done by coders. And now when we fast forward to Wix um, and these um, systems, it allows non-technical people to be able to build websites or build websites without having to learn code which is just a huge paradigm shift because it means that uh, you don't have to pay someone to do it. And if you're a busy person being a campaigner, then uh, yes, you still need to learn some skills. Uh, you still need to learn the tools, but you can do it a lot quicker and more accessible. So th to me, this is really exciting um, about bringing the web back to people. The, and the, the exciting thing about Divi and page builders is it's bringing that functionality to WordPress. So that allows you to have that functionality that uh, Wix has, and then we can also then plug that in with the power of WordPress, with all the plugins and all the things that WordPress can do. Um, so to me, this is a massive deal um, in the evolution of website, websites and, and WordPress in particular, to the point where I've moved my entire production uh, model to uh, using Divi. So I used to make, make most of my income from building and coding themes. So I do have those skills um, and I can continue selling those. But what makes it more exciting for me is that um, I'd rather work with somebody to empower them how to build the website and I'd rather spend that money on content and actually get the campaign running. Uh, it allows us to build faster uh, and uh, allows us yeah, so much more. Um, so I'll show some examples in a, in a little bit. Um, but for me, uh, Divi is a really big deal. Um, and in saying that though, I'm also waiting for the next generation. I think that Divi can be improved upon. And what it will take is somebody to look at Divi and say, hey, I can do that better. And they'll write a new script. So I'm looking forward to the next generation of tools, which will make it far more easier. And I see that they're going to evolve to be more like graphic design software. Um, but yeah, at the moment, um, it's really exciting. Divi, so this is Divi's website. So the, the company itself, Elegant Themes, used to run the old model of being a theme foundry. And uh, if you look at, if you came to the theme uh, webinar that I did, then I had went through a lot more detail. And this company was smart because they saw what was happening in the fact that people don't want to buy themes, they want a, a theme framework. And so they built a theme framework. So this is the website here. Uh, and I assume that this website's built in Divi, um, so you can sort of see what it can do. Um, but I'll let you go there on your own account. And I'll just jump back. Ah, the other really exciting thing about Divi on the intro is testing and experimentation. So because the cost of production and designing has gone down so substantially and the speed, it just means that we can experiment with pages. You know, in the old days, we used to have to go through a long period of um, prototyping and planning and making sure that what we built was right because it was really expensive to build the website. Now we just build a page. And so if you're experimenting different layouts, different language, 
um, different approaches, um, different pages for different target audiences, like all that experimentation that's really key for, um, you know, good campaigning. Um, you can just do it. Um, so that's really exciting. And also Divi has A-B testing built in. So that means that you can put half of your, you can do two layouts on one page and then half the audience goes to one, half the audience goes to the other, therefore you can test. So I'm just going to jump to WP Bakery. Um, so this was one of the first generation or, or the first major page builder in WordPress. Um, this is the most used builder at the moment. What's that for? For 4,300,000 4, users or something like that. Um, I now see that this is an outdated technology. Um, it's so it's got so much stats because all old websites are running it. So I recommend that if um, if you are looking at a page builder, then um, you'd skip this one. So the, in my opinion, the, the leading one is Divi and Elementor. The difference between these two applications really is the equivalent to Holden and Ford. Some of one does one, some things a little bit better, some does the other things a little bit better. They're pretty much very similar. Um, so you may um, do the workshop in Divi and most of, if not everything I'm going to show you in Divi should be able to be done in Elementor. You'll just have to learn you know, a little bit way of doing it. And then also there's a whole list of um, other page builders. This is just a blog. Um, Oh, there's quite a few here with um, descriptions and things like that. So there may be a certain reason that you might want to use another um, page builder, maybe a certain plugin or a certain thing works better with it or, or whatever. However, I've moved to Divi um, and that's what we're going to go through today. Uh, and I'm just going to show you some examples of what we've been building with it. So if you came to our um, advanced WordPress um, Wednesday, I was using this as an example of showing some of the advanced plugins. Um, however, the actual website itself is built in Divi. Um, so we can also do some more artistic based stuff in Divi. Um, this one was really uh, interesting in the fact that I um, spent an hour or two training the customer, the client. She just built the website. She came back, asked a few questions and that was done. So that is, is the paradigm shift is that uh, a non-coder just built their website and um, rather than having to pay a huge amount of money for some specialist. Um, again, this is again, another Divi, a bit more um, detailed and complex. And same, same construct is that um, I'm instructing and, and nurturing and training, mentoring clients rather than actually building it. This is an interesting example because this website was built by one of the Australia's leading agencies. And they built it, they custom built a theme in the old way where you would write the code. And um, that was expensive. Uh, I'm not sure what they spent on it. But the problem was, is because it was custom written, they weren't able to um, adjust it or do much with it. So then I pretty much grabbed all the graphic design. So this, this isn't my design. So I grabbed the existing design. So the fonts and the layouts and the pictures and stuff. And I just migrated it to Divi. Um, and now that allows the client to actually control and work on their website. We also um, did quite an um, extensive library, built extensive library assets, so that then when they're building the actual power partner pages, that they are able to um, then, if I can find one, um, oh no, it's on the home page. So that allows them to um, really like to, to update it, keep the website going and all that sort of stuff. So um, I, in this context, I did some of the some of the functionality that I went through yesterday and added that in. So yeah, they, this is all based on templates so the client can load in. Um, this one here, we you were using an advanced booking engine, but you can see the aesthetics are different. So in that context, if you you've got a graphic designer or you've got um, a brand personality and you really want to um, push the aesthetics and design, um, I come from a design background, so. That's one thing I do love about Divi. I mean, you can do pretty much anything in it um, as far as design. So I do recommend that you keep to good website design principles, but however, from your aesthetic, um, Divi is actually a really good tool for building. Um, this is another example where the client built the site, <laughs> their own site. Um, this is showing a different approach. So you can sort of see, you know, we can mix things up a little bit. Um, yeah, so I've got a heap more examples, but I think that gives you the idea of um, what it can do. And I'll just jump back to me. Okay, so 
I just also want to talk a little bit more about um, this because if you're going to invest your whole, um, you know, website um, strategy on a certain platform, you really want to know that it's well, that it's good. And also for me, who's not just building a website, I'm, I'm investing in lots of websites. So um, it's got, it's really good for development. So this is me putting my advanced hat on. It's got a stand, it, it supports the standard template structure. So the advanced stuff that we did in the um, next level WordPress on Wednesday, custom post types, custom taxonomies, custom fields work really well in Divi. Um, it works really well with WooCommerce and other plugins. So um, it works really well as a theme that wraps plugins. So um, it, it's a great tool for that. The CSS, and I want to talk a little bit about CSS at the tail end, works really well in it. I like the CSS system. And CSS is the language that controls the aesthetics. Uh, it's well documented. Um, and I was going to make a comment on what I thought of their support. The thing is, I can't remember the last time I've used their support. Um, so that is actually a really good thing to say. It's like I haven't actually needed support um, because it's, um, it's well documented and it does its thing. Um, there are some cons of it. Um, it's free, but not, not quite. And I'll talk about license in a minute. minute. I also think the tool's not quite there yet to be a perfect drag and drop page builder. Um, it's close, but not, not quite. Um, there is a learning curve to learning the tool, but you're gonna be good at it by the end of this webinar. Um, but that's still a two hour training that, that we need to do. In saying that though, any other tool is gonna to take a learning curve as well. Elementor is, is also gonna take a learning curve. So that just comes with the, with the territory. But I do think that um, the next generation maybe will be a bit easier. Um, the migration of content. So what that means is that when, when you want to change themes in the future, um, Divi uses a, a specific way that it uses its code that doesn't migrate as well. That's not a big issue, but it, it is one of the, the cons of it. The big con of using Divi or Elementor or any of these systems is it locks you into using their plugin to do the pages that we build. Um, so that's worth noting and I'll talk a little bit about that on um, a little bit later as well. It's buggy on slow connections. So if you're in remote Queensland and you're trying to edit a Divi website, um, sometimes it'll be buggy because it's not loading the scripts fast enough. So that can be an issue. Um, it's lacking style library items and I'll talk about that a little later. I've found that the third party plugins are pretty crappy. So so in that context, when I'll show you modules in a little bit, um, but you can get plugins which give you more functionality in Divi, more modules. I haven't used many of these, but I've found that the ones I have used um, have caused issues um, in the future. Like they haven't been updated quick enough, for example. Um, I was using one for a contact form and then it broke the contact form. That's obviously a critical fail. So I just unplugged all of those um, plugins. Um, also, if you're running ad blockers, I'm specifically using a browser called Brave, which has them built in, it can affect the um, theme editors and things like that. So if you're having problems with uh, Divi, just ensure that you don't have um, ad blockers. Or another approach is to install another browser, a different type of browser, and then you could use that as well. Okay, so licensing. So Divi is still open source. So that means that it's the code is still free. So legally, you could grab the entire Divi code base and then start another company that sells, and you, you, you'd have to change the name, but you can, you can actually sell that. So Divi actually, um, the code itself is free. So you still have freedom and that sort of stuff. So what you're really paying for in the context is not the code itself, but you're paying for your um, updates and you're paying for your, here, I'll just share screen to show the pricing. You're paying for updates and support. Um, so if I jump to the Divi pricing page, um, pricing, um, so it is not a cheap tool. It's $89 a year. That's us. The exchange rate is pretty hectic at the moment. So that would probably work out to be 150 bucks or you could buy a lifetime license. Um, so it's not cheap. Now this allows you to run it on multiple websites. So for me, it is very cheap because I'm running like 30 sites off this one license. Um, so in that context, you could, um, 
potentially borrow somebody's license or add on to their license. Or if there's a group of you, you could chip in for a license as well because it will still allow you to access the updates. That's the main thing that you want so that it comes through the WordPress update system. So it's always updated. Now, the good thing about Divi is it's updated regularly. That means they're doing security fixes and they're um, doing, uh, making things better and all those sort of things. So I do recommend um, that you will need it to be updated. Uh, yeah. Um, Sorry, I'll just jump back to share. I got a bit excited there. Okay, so to install, um, to install Divi is just like any um, theme. You see, you just, we'll come back to our dashboard and then we go to appearance, themes. So you, you log into the Divi WordPress, you, into the Divi website, you download it and then you come here and then you go add new upload theme, you choose the Divi file and then upload it. Um, and now I've already got it installed, so I'm not going to show you that. Um, but yes, yeah, it's, it's just the standard um, Divi uh, approach. Now in the context is if you're developing in Divi, then you'll need a child theme. And I went through child themes when I was talking about um, advanced WordPress and also in the theme section. Um, especially if you're using custom post types and, and those sort of things, if you're customizing, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a DV works really well with child themes. Um, so that's great as well. All right. So now I'm just going to talk a little about the DV fundamentals and talk a bit about default versus DV builder. And by default, I mean the standard WordPress page. So if you add a new page or add new post, you either have a classic editor or you have the block editor. Um, so that's what I mean by WordPress default. Now what Divi does is it puts a whole new editing system on top of that. Um, and what it also does is it runs in parallel. So on your website, you can choose for any page or post whether you run Divi or whether you don't. So you wanna make a decision about that based on future planning. So in the context where I said, um, in the future, you may want to change themes and it locks you in a little bit. So if you, so with the commons library, for example, they've got 200, they've got 200 um, posts. Now, if they migrate theme and they use the Divi builder, they would have to rebuild 200 posts. That looks like a lot of work, right? So that doesn't make sense. So what we've done is we've switched off the Divi builder on posts on the, um, the commons website. So that means that they've got 200, po 200 posts that are in default. So when we change themes, they just come across. Um, now for a lot of the, like the home page and the about page, the donate page, and some of these important pages, we've used the Divi um, framework. So therefore we can make the best pages we can possible. And therefore um, when we migrate the theme in the future, then we'll um, just rebuild those pages. But we're, pl we're planning to do that. If you've got a privacy policy and some other boring documentation that's like whatever, keep it default. Um, the default WordPress page um, looks just fine. Um, obviously the builder will make far better pages. Um, however, if it's a privacy policy, like it's the content that, that matters. So yeah, just have a think about your future building. If you've got a three page website, none of this matters. But if you're gonna build a web page, if you're gonna have like 30 pages, 100, 200 pages, you really wanna be thinking about this. Um, also Divi has um, settings, um, which I didn't I'll add to the run sheet, um, which allows you to switch off certain settings for different users. So you might actually just switch things off so that people can't access them. Um, okay, so I also, um, the other um, important concept is to talk about the front end and back end. So, uh, if you've used WordPress before, you'll know what I mean, but I'm just going to go through it just to confirm that everyone's on the same page. So I'm adding a page here, add new page. This is the uh, WordPress block editor. This is what I call the back end. So this is the back of WordPress or where the dashboard is. Um, so I'm just going to add a test, test page. Now you can see there, we've got a big purple button that says, um, build your layout using Divi. So in this context, you can, um, you've got a choice there, what we're just discussing. So you might just say, use the default editor. 
And in this context, it's now just jump back to the default block editor, um, or if you're using classic, it would do the same thing. Now you can use the Divi Builder on the back end or the front end. Now I recommend that you use the front end because two reasons, well, that's the power of Divi, you're building a drag and drop system. Um, so it just works so much better in a front end. Um, also, I Divi sort of reducing functionality for the back end, um, or they'll prioritize the front end. Now, it's still um, useful to have access to your back end because in this context, we've got the Yoast SEO plugin that I showed you uh, in previous webinars. So you still wanna be able to access, you know, things like that. If we've got custom posts, those, uh, sorry, custom fields. Um, there are other things you'll need to come in and edit it with that. So you could click that big uh, purple button, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the front end. So this is um, a default page. So as you can see, it just looks like a normal page. We've got a sidebar on the right. So again, if it's the privacy policy, this is totally fine to do that. So you wouldn't. So I'm going to click this big uh, purple button, and what they'll do is it'll now load Divi. Okay, so a question. Is it buggy for admins on remote connections or also for people accessing the website? Uh, no, it's just buggy for admins on, on slow connections. Um, and I also will note that I haven't, I haven't seen that for a while, so, um, but that can happen. Once you've got the web page built, um, Divi is, is pretty good. Um, it, well, the tool's not, not active anymore. So once you've saved that page and you're out of the Divi Builder, then those Divi Builder's not, involved in that page anymore if that makes sense because it'll write the code to the page um, like any website and we're going to go through that next um, session is we want to also cache and optimize our website but you do that in the same way as if you're using any website builder so just in summary the issues, the issues i was saying about remote issues are only for the builder um, and they're, they're reasonably minimal as well okay so if you create a um, TV page where you're going to get these three options and I'm going to go through the purple one later choose a pre-made layer the one on the right should make sense to you it just clones another page so if you've you've done a heap of work on your uh, about page and it looks really great and you're you're wanting to do a donation page and you're like oh well I want it to be like the about page sort of so you could just load the about page in and then you then from there you can just start editing it so this is really a good feature for um, doing that. I generally um, build from scratch. Um, so what this just means is it's gonna bring in a blank Divi page. And I'm gonna show you all the things of building a Divi. That's the whole point of what we're doing today. So um, we're gonna click this one. Okay, so you'll see that not much has changed. But if I roll over, and remember Divi um, uses rollovers a lot. So you make sure that you start using your mouse and rolling over. So I'm, I'm now gonna give you a tool of all the different um, bits and pieces. But first I'm gonna start, before we start building, I'm gonna click this purple button down here. And here we go. So I'm gonna start from the left and go through the tools. This gives you a block mode. Um, I'll show you this in a little bit, um, which gives you more of a um, schematic, um, layout for it. This is really useful when you're just block starting a page, you could start building the blocks this way. Or if your page gets too confusing, and you're like, oh, I don't know what the sections and stuff are, you're confused, you can come to here. Sometimes if you're putting zero padding on things, or sometimes some of the hovers get a little buggy, um, you can come to this view and then all the buttons are easy to come to. So I'll show you this view again when we've got some content in. Um, this is desktop view. This will show you what it looks like on a tablet, and this will show you what it looks like on a mobile. Now in saying that though, I generally, the way I work is I'll just grab the bottom right hand corner of my browser, and I'll just drag it. And this, and the reason I prefer to drag it is because rather than having three um, widths, I'm sort of testing the rough gist of all the widths. Because as you know, think about now the amount of devices that we get, the different size screens, tablets, all that stuff, uh, pretty much you cannot target for a specific width anymore. So it's good just to see what the rough gist of, of it. You want it roughly looking good on all widths. Obviously you're targeting desktop and mobile um, and tablet are, are sort of the rough ones. 
Okay, so this, this one here accesses your library, which I'm going to jump through uh, later in the tutorial. This um, allows you to save this page to the library. Um, this is a little bit redundant because you can just load any page anyway. This will allow you to uh, bin it, which we don't want to do. Um, this button here gives you some settings. Um, so in theory, these are the settings from the, the back from the, the back end. But I tend to go to the back end because um, you know I've usually got other things loaded in, like USDSO SEO, whatever. This gives you a, a history. So there's two histories that we're running at the moment in parallel. One is the Divi um, history, and then you've also got your default WordPress history. And here is something that's really exciting: is that you can actually transport pages between websites. So if you're working on multiple websites and you've done this really beautiful donate page that's really complex on, on one of your websites, you go, I just want that on my new website. You can just export it and import it straight into your new website. That's the same with all your settings, your library, like all of Divi is portable. So that's also exciting if you're working on multiple websites. Okay, and then obviously the good old save button, which is important to be saving things the um, visual builder we've got some buttons here so we can if we hit exit visual builder I usually right mouse click then I've got here my front front end also if I want to go to the back end I can then hit edit page and this will go to the back end so exit visual builder goes to the front end without the builder exit edit page goes to the back end editor all right so I'm gonna build from scratch okay so the exciting thing about Divi is rows and columns. Uh, it sounds a little bit naff, but as a web designer, actually coding columns was complex. Um, I won't go more high, but here we go. We have now three columns. That should make sense to you. Um, the exciting thing about this is that you've got three columns and you change your mind and you go, I want four columns. You just click the button and just do four columns. Um, that's awesome because you may have a home page with three things and you go, oh, we've got an event coming up. We can just put it on the home page. You can also click here and add more columns here, um, et cetera, et cetera. So columns should make sense to you. Um, now above here, so we've got this purple section, uh, blue section, sorry. Now that blue section is what we call well, it's a section. So we've got a section and then we've got rows. So most pages will actually only have one section. Now the, the way that I look at sections, and I'll just show you a website to um, visualize using sections. So in this website, see how I've got the background image here, and then now I've got another background image. And I'm coming to another background image. Um, so in that case, I've used different sections because we can then put a, an image in the background. Um, so that's generally what we're using sections for. So unless you're, you've got a reason to use sections, then you're just, um, you wouldn't be using a section. Um, so you just use the one section, sorry. So that's the one section. Um, and to add a new section, you simply hit either duplicate here. This will duplicate it. Uh, I'm gonna bin that. Or if you roll down and come down to here, the positive sign, you click on that. And we have some options down here for different sections. Full width sections, for me, uh, an old uh, legacy thing from when Divi didn't support full width very well. Divi now supports full width very well, and I'll show you how to do that later. So I generally, I haven't even looked in full width since I can remember. Um, specialty is useful, and I'll show you why. I'll just jump. So in a traditional web, web page where we've got sidebars, this replicates a sidebar context. So if we have three columns and we've got a sidebar in the right, and then we have another um, row, that sidebar will sit above that row. Whereas what this will do is allow, like you can see visually what the pictures are saying, it will allow that sidebar to just be full, um, the full sidebar. So this, this specific layout here is much more um, suited to a traditional um, layout with a sidebar on the right. And we still have the option here within the left sidebar, so the left, left main column section, 
to have rows and columns. So I've just put them in there. Now, just if you're getting confused right now, I'm going to now click on this button. So this is now our block layout. So we can now see the layouts a little bit clearer. So we've got this uh, blue section, which is the standard section. Now we've got the fancy section. Um, so you can see here, it's slightly different simply that this has got a sidebar and this is, and the row section fits within that, if that makes sense. So I'm just going to close that and I'm going to jump back to the, the visual view. So that's sections and rows. And so now I'm going to jump into modules and modules are really the key um, thing with Divi, um, the way it works. And so it's a little bit like the, the tools um, that you're going to build with. So if you think of Lego modules are your Lego blocks, they're going to put together to make your spaceship. Um, okay. So there's a whole bunch of um, modules and I'm just going to show you the most powerful one of all is the text module. Now it sounds a bit lame to say that the text module is the most powerful. Um, however, it is because if you um, went through the advanced um, WordPress webinar, we talked about OEmbed, we talked about galleries, we talked about all these things that you can do with the um, text editor in, in WordPress. This brings in all of that. So it also, um, yeah, allows you to lay out things and things like that. So I generally, most of the modules that I use are the text module. But what that allows you to do is use the sophisticated column system. And um, also once I showed you the basics of the um, modules, then I'm going to show you the graphic design and the, the um, modding and all that sort of stuff, which is really exciting. All right, so this is a um, text module. So I'm just going to go, yeah. Now this now puts text there. There's two ways now of editing this text. You could just click straight on it and you can just edit it like so, which is, da -da -da. but you don't get any options. You just get to edit it. But this is great if you're just going to do a quick um, typo fix, whatever. So once you come off here, you can't now go back to that um, edit to, to get to those settings. So I'm just going to click off it, click somewhere else. Now that's that the settings are there. What this, this, um, this crossbar lets you do, just move the modules. So you can just drag and drop your modules around. This one is duplicate. So if you're, you know, you've got a module that's half what you want, you can just move that to there. Um, okay, but this cog, so the cog is the settings. So I'm gonna click on the cog. And um, this is the standard uh, WordPress editor, um, WYSIWYG editor, so I'm not gonna go in much detail of this. However, you can get to text mode there. So if I scroll down, um, okay, so I will actually now just jump through the modules just to give you an idea of what the modules are. Um, okay, so an accordion. Yeah, have you ever seen on a website where you've got an FAQ and then um, you click on a tab and it opens up? That's what an accordion is. An audio allows you to embed an audio sample now your text um, editor will do that as well. Bar counters are simply um, a bells and whistles. So you can put some numbers in there and they'll show you the bars. Also, if you want to visualize this, we can jump onto the Divi website. So I'm just going to do a really quick tour of this bit because in your own, it's best in your own time just to click on the things and then open, open them up. Um, I'm just going to talk more about the important ones that I use. Now, blog is actually a really important one. What that does is it brings in the entire um, uh, blog system. So in that context, you can make custom blog pages. So if this is a news page, the exciting things is you can bring in specific categories. So just say you wanted a simple events website. So instead of using an events plugin, you might just use post blog posts and say we've got an event on. So then on the events page, you could just run the events category and feed that in. You can also turn some, turn the elements on and off. So you can talk, you know, turn off the author. If you have a look on the right, it's going to do that. I can turn off the categories, that sort of stuff. So yeah, the blog module is really useful. And also in design, it will give you either a full width layout. So this is what you think of a standard blog where you've got um, the image on the top, the text, and it just goes down vertical. This one here will give you a grid layout. 
which won't make sense with one column. So I'm just going to jump to another another row. Um, uh, that, so excited. Then I drag that to here. And so that gives you a grid, grid layout of your blog post. These don't have any images, but then they'll show an image there. So this is really good because you can, on your blog page, you may actually want to have a, you know, donate to us at the top and you can sort of design, design that page. So that module is really um, used quite a lot. Um, a blurb, this is a way of formatting. So there's a few um, similar ones, blurb and call to action. What they are is they have an image, a title and a link. Um, they're formatted in a, a specific way. So if that works well for you, then use them. I tend to just use a text editor and I'll write my own heading and my own link and my own image. Buttons are really useful, um, especially in UX design, user interface design. So if you're like book now or donate now, it makes sense to use a button rather than a link because it just makes much more sense. So you can customize buttons. Um, circle counter is bells and whistles. Code, this is an important um, module. So in the webinar, yes, um, Wednesday, we talked about embedding external services. So you might have an a, um, action network form, you may have a MailChimp form, you may have some other um, things you want to embed. This is where you would embed it. So you stick your code in here. And what that does is it allows, it, it reduces the WordPress trying to clean up your code because um, you don't want it cleaned up, you want it as it is, so it works as you expected it to. So that's an important module. Um, okay, code, comments. Um, I switch comments off, so I'm not sure why. Um, like you may have a case scenario, of course. Contact form. I don't recommend using the Divi contact form. Um, again, I discussed this in the advanced um, WordPress because it doesn't have a um, Capacha. It's got, okay, so now I'm a liar. It, this, they've just actually added this in recent um, recent um, versions. That's exciting actually, um, because that was one of my big criticisms of the, the TV forms. It didn't have a Capacha, so that's exciting. Um, my other criticism though of the form is that the email um, doesn't go anywhere. So it sends the email to you, but if the form fails, then the email gets lost. Whereas if you're using an email form like Gravity Forms or something like that, that, you send an email and if there's a problem with the send, you still have that in the database. So maybe I need to do some research and maybe they're doing that functionality because I haven't actually looked at the contact form in a while. Um, but that's really exciting because now they do have the uh, patches. Um, it's always good when they, and that's the great thing I'm liking about Divi is because whenever I'm in there showing something, they've made something better. So um, that is a great thing. Um, okay, so contact form, countdown timers, just bells and whistles, email opt-in. So this allows you to um, add um, your email account, MailChimp. So, so this is one that's dedicated to actual um, recruitment forms. So this is more aimed at mainstream stuff, not so much not-for-profit. So, um, but you may use one of these mainstream systems. Um, but with Salesforce, for example, some, some not-for-profits use. I'm going to show you another way of doing that in a little bit as well, um, if you're using a custom system. Uh, okay, so other modules. Now, divider is more for aesthetics. Um, you can, it allows you to put some design where you can put like a squirrel or background or something like that. Uh, that just works for um, yeah, dividing your content in an aesthetic way. Filterable portfolio. So Divi comes with a custom post type called portfolio. Let me just show you that actually. Um, let me go back to the admin. And here we've got projects. So if we go add new, and then, um, this is separate to a blog post. This is separate to a page. It's a project. Um, so this is designed for graphic design folios so, uh, or web designers. So website example. 
Now, I, as a web developer, don't use this for various reasons, but I won't go through that now. It's a bit more complex. Um, publish that. So then um, what this module here is doing is it's bringing in, it displays it a little bit like a blog post, but it's optimized more for graphics. So I'll give you uh, image um, and, and the text as if it's a portfolio. Um, I don't use this system because of portability. So if I'm building a folio and I've got 30 uh, website examples, I don't want to have to migrate that when I um, move off Divi. However, you could use it a bit differently. Like you may, um, you may use it for um, projects that you're working on. So if you're not for profit, you may be, you know, a tech not for profit, you may be doing skill shares, you may have some, a mental program, you may have, you know, a um, computer recycling program. So you could use those, those projects and then you could display them. So, you know, have a play with that. Um, if that seems like it will work for you. Now, gallery is an image gallery. Um, it, that's actually a really good image gallery because what it'll do is it'll do a thumbnail view. You click on it and then it'll open up to be a full image and you can click on the next. An image makes sense. Login. So this is good for members only um, pages. So I built one um, for a client recently where it's a members only site. But then I could design the home page that you log in to be uh, a Divi page. So we could add content and pictures and stuff and then we've got the login. This will bring you a Google map. Now to use it you need to use you need to install a Google API key. I'll show you where to do that later. It's a it's a bit of a pain because you've got to go create a Google account, you've got to create a Google Maps account, you've got to put a credit card in, you've got to make sure that it's synced up correctly. It is a bit of a process but that will allow you to put Google Maps as a Divi module. Another way around it, if you don't want to go through that whole process, is you could go to Google Maps, put your pin on the map and screenshot it and bring it in as an image. That's sort of a bit of a cheats way of doing it. Um, okay, so menu, this puts a menu at the uh, menu module. Now, um, I don't use this for body copy, um, body menus, because what it does is it will shrink the menu down like a, um, like a, um, a hamburger. So, for example, so I'm... Um, so see how this menu has gone to a hamburger. This is uh, ubiquitous on websites. It makes sense. Everyone understands that on a mobile, you click on that and it opens the menu. But if you've got one in the middle of the page, it's confusing. It's not, you know, so I recommend not using that menu. There's one place where we can use it and I'll show you that later. Um, so generally, um, I don't use that, that module. And it hasn't shrunk back. That's okay. I'm going to jump to this view to get it, force it back. There we go. All right. So click on the positive. It's going through the modules again. Um, number counters, bells and whistles. Person's useful. Um, it does what it says. You can put a photo, you can put a, their, their title and description, but you can also put their social media accounts on that. So it's got a nice little display. Portfolio I talked about before. Post navigation um, is, is useful. I'll just show you what that is. So um, uh, where was the comments library? I have an example here later. Here it is. So if I scroll down to here, so this is a page of blog posts. And if I scroll down here, we've got the, this part here. So this is the, the navigation. So if there's more blog posts, then that will do that. If you just add a blog, it, it won't add that. Um, okay. Now, post slider. Uh, if you've been to any of my recent webinars, you know I hate sliders. I don't think we should use them, they're bad. If you really insist on using a slider, then I'll leave you to it. Okay, post title. This is a really important module. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just going to turn off everything, turn off the meta, and I'm going to turn off featured image. So now it doesn't sound that interesting. It doesn't look that interesting. But if I put that over here, actually, what I need to do is I'm going to add a new row just for it. New row to move that up there and move this here. What this is is the page title. Um, okay, so if we've just go to a normal page, it will have a page title. So if I just jump to, to another page we create, see how it's got graphics there. 
Now, every page except for the home page should have a page title. It's just best practice. It's also really important because Google puts a lot of emphasis on other search engines on that page title. So you, you must have a page title. And I recommend that you actually use the Divi page title because uh, what Divi will let you do is remove the page title with the, in the page builder because that will format it correctly with the proper tags and that for Google. So I recommend that any page that you're building, the first thing, the first module you add is the page title module. Um, unless you've got a good reason not to, of course, there may be certain reasons and, you know, it's, it's not a hard in stone rule, but generally every page should have a page title. All right, um, post title, pricing tables. So you would have seen uh, on the internet, like especially with software, they've got three columns. Here's the different features, different pricing. Um, it's a sort of average pricing table, so you can um, have a play with it. If you're not happy with it, there's plugins. Um, I went through a heap of plugins uh, a year ago or so, and it would be better now, um, that had like better pricing tables. Search, you know what a search, site search is. That will allow you to do uh, searching. And coming down the list, um, search. Now shop. This, this is um, an important module if you have WooCommerce installed. And we went through WooCommerce in the last webinar. This will allow you basically to bring in, um, from a technical point of view, bring in all the WooCommerce short codes. So this is an easier way of doing it. Um, however, if you um, were trying to do something specific, you could also look at the WooCommerce um, short codes. But you can choose like recent products, the best products, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're using WooCommerce, as I mentioned earlier, um, Divi is actually really good for WooCommerce. And you can do pretty advanced like shop pages with that. Sidebar, this is really powerful. Um, now in the old days, and I, when I talked about the, um, the WordPress fundamentals in that course, we talked about widget areas. So widget areas are sidebars. Generally they're in the right-hand column. Sometimes they're in the footer. So this allows you to use the widget system. So if I jump um, back to my back end, um, where's my back end? Apologies. Uh, we're going to go appearance widgets. So if you use WordPress, you would have seen this screen here. This is what the sidebar does. And um, Divi actually allows you to create your own sidebar. So you might go uh, on our campaigns page. We want to campaigns. We want to have a, our own sidebar where we can manage that. So we need to reload the page if we create a new side page, new sidebar. So you can see here now we've got a campaigns sidebar and widgets. So if you're not familiar with widgets, this will be a bit confusing, but I'm assuming that you've got a basic understanding of WordPress here. So apologies if this bit's not making sense. Um, so we can do a widget here. And then if we come back to our, um, our page, we save that and then we reload it. So we can reload that code back in. So this is running off the desktop. So you can see an idea of, of um, how long things take to load off. This is without the internet. So if you've got a slow internet connection, you'll see that that's going to slow. So if I go to um, sidebar, this now gives me the option of all the sidebars plus this new one that I've just put in. So this is really useful um, for layout design, especially you could use the, um, the advanced sections when I showed you the sections, it was designed to have a sidebar. But for example, some plugins work best as a widget. So it might be a, a list of your categories, for example, works best as a widget. So you could create a widget, new widget area. Um, you could then bring this into Divi and that brings in your, why isn't that saving? There we go. So that's brought in my widget area. So that, yeah, that brings in that whole um, widget system which is really, really useful for some contexts. Um, social media follow. This is really good because it'll put your um, social media um, accounts, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, that sort of stuff. Um, tabs. 
This is where you'll see data, where you've got boxes and tabs at the top, and you can click the different tabs and load that data. Um, studies have shown that that data gets lost, so I would not use that for main important content. Where it works well is, say, on the Apple website, where they're showing a, a, a laptop, and they've got the main, main system, the main sales points there. Then they may have a tab for you know specifications and warranty and fine print and you know the stuff that if someone's really interested like really wants to know they're about to buy a computer and they're like well i want to know what the the, the ram and the um piece the um, processor is so they, they are going to look for that tab and find it i wouldn't use tabs for if you're like this is campaign information because people aren't necessarily looking for that because they don't know that it's there so it will get lost Testimonial, I use a fair bit for my testimonials. That just gives you a box with the, um, the, the, um, the inverted commas at the top. It works nice though. Um, text is my uh, obviously the most powerful one, so you'll be using text the most. Toggle is the same as an accordion, so it will give you titles, and then when you click on it, it will open it up. Difference between a toggle and a, um, a um, accordion, is that an accordion, when you click on a new one, it will close the old one, whereas a toggle will keep them all open. So depending on what you want to do um, with your layout design. Video, this allows you to put a video in. So you can put a video in by the text editor, or you may want to use the Divi uh, video. Which way do you use? Well, I'd have a play with the Divi one, see exactly what it does. So I'm not going to show you exact things on Divi, because we'll be here all day and it'll be boring. The best thing is, what I'm trying to do is give you an overview, so you go in and play. You go, oh yeah, I know it does this because I remember Glenn showed me. Then you can figure out where to get to rather than me spend the whole like six hour webinar doing exact details. Um, and also Divi has documentation, Divi has its own videos. Um, video slider, that doesn't make sense to me. You've got a video. If you want to have multiple things in a video, you'd make the video do that. All right, so that's the, um, the modules. So this is really the power of um, Divi. They're the bits of the Lego that you can use to, to, um, to build it. So now I'm gonna to jump to Divi, to the module settings, because as well as having all these actual uh, modules, um, we've actually got quite a lot of settings. So let me just click on the settings button. And again, I'm just gonna give you a quick tour. There's lots of settings. There's lots and lots and lots of settings. So um, in your own time, but I'm gonna give you a quick tour. So um, let's just jump down, link. This allows you to link the whole module. So you can link a whole section, you can link a whole row. Like most of these settings also apply to sections, rows and modules. Um, they're slightly different, but generally the settings are the, um, go across everything. So what I'm showing you here, you can probably do for most things. So if you think about Divi, everything's editable. Okay, so if you're gonna put a link on a whole section, it probably doesn't make sense from a user perspective. It makes maybe sense if you've got a, an image and maybe a description, you could make that whole block a um, link. So just think about you, how you look at it as far as a link. If you make a whole row a link, it doesn't make sense. You can do that though. You can put a link on anything. So here's where you put your link. Backgrounds. You can put a background um, color background this is the color you can put a background blend you can put a background image you can put a background video on any module any column any row any section so for example if we jump to this website you can see i've got a image on the background of the section in the actual row i've got a color which is black, and then I've got a 50% transparency on that, which gives you that effect there. So yeah, you can do all the things in graphic design. Um, so if I just jump back to um, the color, if I jump to there, this allows me then to do the transparencies um, that I spoke to you about. So this is quite a cool little graphic design tool um, as far as doing those effects, um, especially this sort of subtle effects where we've got um, translucent colors over things. Uh, especially if you want to put text over an image, um, but it's not very clear and legible, then you can put a background color, drop, drop the opacity, um, which is really, really good. Um, now admin label doesn't really mean much. It just changes. If I jump to this view, 
it just changes. It says it's search shop sidebar. You can change that. Um, I never do, except for one website where I've got my whole folio, which are blocks, and so I've named them so I actually know what they are. It's really that page is really confusing. So that specific page, I've um, named them. All right, so let's just jump to our exciting design panel and look at all these options. Whew. Now, I also want to make a, co a comment here is just because you can do it doesn't mean you should. For example, your typography should not be edited here. Your colors of your fonts should not be edited here. You should be editing your fonts and your colors and your design in the global settings, which I'm going to show you next. So that means that your website is consistent. Consistency and repetition makes things look professional. So unless you want to do it like a punk uh, website that's meant to look really disjointed and um, mad and all over the place, you would then change the fonts everywhere. If you're trying to um, have a consistent, professional or easy to navigate website, you'd, you'd do all your fonts global. Now there are exceptions. So for example, in this page, um, oh actually, if I'm running a training, so I'm now giving them away for free, but I, I was doing them professionally, I would have a box here and then I'd, I'd custom make a module. And I'd, I'd say so this one here, sorry, this is a custom one. So usually I've got a book now button here, but see I've changed the titles to be yellow and I've, I've changed the design, which is different to down here. But this is one off. This is like an important call to action. So I've got a specific brief on why I'm changing away from the default and so this is an example where i've done that so although you can change the fonts and colors don't do it unless you've got a really strategic reason to do it you're best to have a consistent look and feel on your website which is good graphic design okay but i'm just give you a quick look here so um these buttons here this is a paragraph link bulleted list um a block quote so that means you can change the color of the link for example okay you can choose the font um, font weight, colors, text size, all that sort of stuff. You can put a shadow on stuff. So I'm going to do a quick version of this because again, go on your own time. There's a lot to go through. So you'll get bored if I go through in detail. Basic layout. Now, um, the text color is useful because it just does a quick flip between if you've got a dark background and a light background. Heading text. This is uh, if you're doing good semantic markup, which I've uh, discussed in earlier webinars. You can choose all of that. Sizing. Okay, so this it will allow you to, um, actually let me just, I'm gonna show you a better example. I'm just gonna jump one row. So, yeah, okay, so this is, this is one row. And let me, um, I'm going to go to just, I'm gonna put a background color so you can see what I'm doing. Get red. I'm gonna go to design spacing. Um, sizing sorry and i'm going to go see it says 80 percent i'm going to put 100 percent you know what i'm doing here right something that we like to do a lot with design. and the maximum width at the moment is 1080 pixels no i want that 100 percent as well okay so if you have a look in the background i've just made that 100 percent the the whole um row so you can see here that um, now my, my module has gone all the way to the right. You may want that look. So if you still wanted that um, to be centered, the way that we'll do that is a little bit of a different approach is that we would then um, go add section, regular, add a row. Um, text, there's some text. Okay, so I'm just now jumped up back into my, my section. I'm gonna put a background color so you can see what I'm doing. And so you can see that that's already 100%. And so, and now I've got this text that looks gaudy and awful. So I can just jump to my text and go, um, and put it on a, a light text. Okay, so now we've got a full uh, background, full width section with color, but then our content is still centered. So um, that's the sizing um, settings. So if I jump back to here, um, if you've got if you've got something that's full width, but then there's a width on, say, your text setting, then you can either center it in the center, left or right. I generally don't touch our heights. There may be a reason why you're doing. You want to control your 
your heights. Spacing. Okay, so if you think of margin and padding, if you've got a square, so in this case, my, um, my module is a square. Padding is a space inside the square. So in, in between the edge of the square and then the, um, the content. And padding is the space around it. So let me visualize that. Let me, um, let me just go into your section. Let me do a row, let me do a module. I'm aware we're three o'clock, so I'll just finish this bit and then we'll have a break. Um, background. Okay. So you can see here that I'll put a background um, and I'm gonna put a background color on the actual, this as well so you can see what I'm doing. Okay, so my, uh, if I put a margin on this, I'll just move that so you can see, um, spacing. If I put a margin on the left, it will put a space in between the, uh, around the left. So there you go. So I've, I've put that to there. And if I want the copy to be uh, moved to the left, I can then put the padding. So you can control those different spacing. Now, Divi comes built with spacing already because the designers of Divi have designed the default Divi to look as best as it can. So if you just uh, grab Divi, throw some content in there, it will just, it should look reasonably good without any fiddling around. So um, it, it has padding. So generally what they're doing, what just if you're trying to, if you want to remove space, so you're going, oh, that's way too spaced. You can, um, they generally put padding. So what I'll generally do is if I want to edit the Divi spacing, I'll just go to zero go to zero and then see what it looks like. Um, and then you can see whether that was Divi or not. You can put negative, um, negative numbers on margins. And what they'll do is all go negative. So you generally use that for overlaps. Never use that for reducing space because it gets really complex. Um, and I've only ever used a negative margin once. Um, in using Divi. So you only use a negative margin, very specific case scenario. Um, a border should make sense, puts a line around it, puts rounded corners around it, um, colors. Box shadow, this will give you a shadow. Okay, so this Divi also involve, in, in, um, includes entire filters. So you'd see these filters on Photoshop, for example. I reckon that if you're doing um, effects, you should be doing them in Photoshop, not really in these tools. Um, this will also tax your um, browser a little bit, but um, sometimes there's a use for it, like opacity, for example, um, and blend modes, same that you have in Photoshop. Um, so yeah, you can do some uh, really arty effects just straight in the, um, this, is, this is plugging into your CSS. Transform. Um, I haven't actually played with this. Now, my understanding is this would be animation, um, which allows you to animate some stuff. So I need to do my homework, um, even as vast as I am used, I haven't used everything. Um, animation, this is just straight animation. Animation is annoying. So don't use it unless you've got a reason to use it, okay? You would see many websites where you load a website in and it's moving and you go, that looks cool. Other times you'll see a website and it's just really annoying. So if you're using animation, be very sophisticated with it and do it with intent. And I'm just gonna jump through all these boxes and then we'll have a break. So we'll be a little late on the break, apologies. So there's all them, them bits and pieces. Now this is our advanced um, tab. I'll show you CSS and um, that later. But this is one that I'm really going to look at. This allows you to disable a module on a phone, tablet, or desktop. So for example, if you had a really uh, a high res image, a video that looked really good on desktop, but was too big for phone, you could bring in two video modules. Uh, the high res one, you can click here to disable on phone. The low res one, you can click to disable on the desktop. You can work out which one goes on the tablet. 
So what they'll do is it'll load the high res video on desktop or it will load the low res on mobile. So that can really allow you to um, have different layouts and all different things on your um, mobile and your um, various options. And what I've got you there on the mobile, um, if I go to design, so just say A setting, text font. Um, so let me do color actually, color will be better. Okay, so, so say I'm making the color purple. If I click on this, it now gives me options for phone and tablet. So you might go, I want it to be purple on the desktop and I want it to be red on the phone. That will allow you to do that. Um, one of the things that we do do that with is font size, because I notice sometimes mobile phones and desktops, um, their font sizes don't match up perfectly. So you could change the fonts and stuff. Um, this will give you a tablet and phone um, colors. This one here is the hover. So if you're putting a link on something, um, maybe a whole module or maybe you're putting a link on a whole row um, then you could actually have it so when it rolls over it makes a different attribute so in this case if it's red and you roll over it becomes purple so that means people know it's really clearly a link if you want someone to call to action you want to make sure those links are really excitable so when they they know it's a link so they see it it's a button they'll look at it and go yeah I can that looks and then when they roll over it it starts reacting they're like yeah this is definitely something to click on so this is what you really want here um, there's a few little bits and pieces here I'll let you um, do your, your, your navigation um, there's a few um, settings that are a little bit more advanced um, so I'm not going to go through but this is the split test I was talking about which will allow you to do a B testing Okay, so that's a bit of an overview of the uh, modules. Um, so building a page on the run sheet. This is what I'm going to do next. I'm just going to just quickly show you some of these examples just to give you an idea of, of what we're, we're doing here. So um, this is a section with two rows. We've got page title here. We've got an advanced custom field um, logo here. This is bringing in um, a map. It's a map plugin. Um, this is a module, which is just a blurb, which has got a, a, a logo, uh, an image, a title, and description. We've done custom CSS on that, like we've changed the colors and stuff. This is just um, two columns on a row, an image, some text, um, one row. Got here we've got uh, two rows, each module, we're just an image and text. Um, let me jump to another one. So this here is simply built with uh, one row, uh, one image, orange background, uh, just three rows, background, text. So you can sort of see how um, using those different bits of tools, those, those, those settings that you can actually build anything. Uh, this one here, I don't recommend using video um, because video will get lost on some users. But the fact that this is an art website, I'm like, well, I'm willing to lose some um, some views. So this is just a section with a background video, four columns, uh, four text, uh, sorry, four image modules. They link through. We've got this background, if you can see it on the Zoom, which is charcoal, it's background image. Um, that's just an image. So. Um, this one here, yeah, background image on a section with two two columns. One of the columns is, is not being used, um, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, yeah, using those tools that I've just run you through, you can do uh, pretty much anything that you want. So I so there's two approaches in that context. One is that you uh, you prototype first. So that may be pen and paper, you know, design your pages where your call to action is, that sort of stuff. Uh, I tend to really use Divi as a prototype tool, but in that context, I'm not gonna put pictures or any colors or anything. I'm just going to just block it out. So, you know, add my rows, add my columns. So that way, if I'm showing a client, I the, the, the web page is a half built. Um, so yeah, I'm prototyping a lot more now in Divi because that just allows, you know, the work's been done. We, we don't have to duplicate and modulate. So that's, that's something that's really good about Divi as well, is now we can use it as a um, prototyping tool. 
Okay, so now I'm going to jump to um, the global design settings. All right, so now I'm going to jump into the global settings. So as I mentioned before, if you want consistency of your graphic design across your website, then you actually do your design um, there. So let me jump to Divi. Um, so I'm just going to go through all these setting options and, and give you a run through what's happening here. So here's where the logo is. The fixed navigation bar. What the fixed navigation bar is, so see how we've got the, the um, navigation at the top and when we scroll, it stays at the top. That's called the fixed navigation. So in that context, um, you could switch that off if you wanted the, the navigation to keep going up. I actually think that's a great thing. Now, you can choose the colors for the, so in the um, examples I showed you before, you would have seen the color picker, this color picker here. Now I can change this for my corporate colors. So just say you've got, um, you know, a style guide, you've actually got um, a, a colors that are your um, organization's colors. So you can come in here and actually add your colors. So that means that your color picker will then um, choose from that. So when you're working on your website, you can just grab your colors really quickly. Um, really good uh, feature there. I'm just going to quickly go through some th the things. Um, Google API key. This is where you do your Google Maps. Switch it off if you're not using it. If you're not using Google fonts, switch them off. Um, show Facebook and Twitter icon. They're a little obsolete now. Where they display is in your secondary menu at the top, which I rarely use. I'll show you that later. And also in the footer. But the Divi footer is, is sucks. So you're going to actually create a custom footer anyway. So these things are a little bit obsolete. Um, this allows you how many posts display on your blog post page. Um, now here's where we put our CSS. And I'm going to show you that right at this right at the end of the tutorial, the CSS. Um, navigation, um, I just use the default WordPress navigation. So there's nothing in here. Here is where you can switch off the Divi Builder. So just say you, um, so with the commons library, we don't want anyone using the Divi Builder on the posts. So we can just switch it off. And so no one can use it. So you can only use the Divi Builder on pages. This also supports custom post types. This is the custom post type that we did uh, in the last session. So I can switch Divi on and off for custom post types. Now I'm gonna click advanced here. And there's two things that's interesting. One is the uh, enable classic editor. This um, means you don't need a plug in if you want to use the classic editor. So uh, if you're using Divi, use this setting rather than that plugin. Static CSS uh, generation. Um, I'll go through where, when I'm doing caching at the next uh, webinar, um, I'll, I'll be teaching you about optimizing websites. This thing um, helps speed up your website, but it also causes bugs and I've had issues with uh, Divi. So if Divi loads in funny, then why you come in here and clear this? This basically is a Divi cache um, and that will um, sometimes cause problems. So if you're uh, unsure, if you're having problems with it, switch it off. I'm generally, I've been switching this off on recent uh, websites and just using um, other ways of caching. So layout, so on a blog post, you may want to turn off the author uh, comments. So this is what's displayed at the top of the blog post. Uh, I don't use ads. SEO, I generally use Yoast SEO, um, and I've gone through that previous webinars. If you don't want to use Yoast SEO, then you've got some basic SEO optimization here. Integration, this is really useful. This allows you to put code into your header. So for example, Google Analytics, you uh, want to add Google Analytics, so you go to Google Analytics, get the code. This is where you paste it, right here in the head. So anything that's requiring code in your head or code in your footer, um, you can put it here as well. So um, that's a little bit more advanced. Now updates. This is where you license Divi. So if you've um, bought your license for Divi, you can put your username and your API key, and this will allows the updates. These settings are portable. So you, if you're, you can transport these across websites. All right, so that's the, the basic settings. So now I'm gonna jump to, to the theme customizer. 
All right, so this is uh, where we're going to do our global settings, um, typography, color, that sort of stuff. Now, this thing on the right here is sort of a live uh, editor example. It doesn't, sometimes it doesn't update, so then you'll have to hit publish and refresh. Okay, I'm just going to run through some settings. Um, here's where you put your side icon. This is the icon that's at the top here. You can see a little elephant. Um, by default, your website's 1080 pixels wide. You may, for some, if you for some reason may want a thinner website, maybe you've optimized your website for mobile and then you're like, it looks a bit weird on a desktop. So you may just actually reduce the width of your whole website. So if I do that, if I make that 900, uh, maybe I'll exaggerate for you and go 400 and publish. That'll bring the width of the website into 400. Oh no, so the minimum's 960, it's not letting me do that. All right, so I brought it into 960 at least doing that. Um, okay, theme accent color. This is an important thing that's hidden away. It took me a while to figure this out. I'm going to give you a pro tip right now. What that does is uh, it controls a few things, but what it mainly controls is this hamburger here. So if you've got a red website and you've got blue hamburger, you can change that color. And again, you see it's not updating live, but if I hit publish and reload, it will turn that red. So this is sort of meant to be a live editor, but it doesn't really work very well as a live editor. But that's not Divi, this is actually WordPress um, default. So there you go, I've got now a red. So it's in general settings, um, layout settings, theme accent. It's a weird place to put it, I know. Anyway, typography. Okay, you understand typography? Here's where you do it. Um, background doesn't make sense. This is a WordPress thing, so ignore that. Um, header and navigation. So you can do some things like have a vertical navigation. Um, so like with the Lizzie O'Shea website, I did that. Hang on, it's not wide enough, there you go. Or you may hide the navigation until you scroll. So that may be useful if you're doing a splash page a really key call to action page, which may be you want someone to sign up. So you've sent them to the page. Here's a sign up page and they're not going to see a nav until they've signed up, for example. Okay. So secondary menu bar. This is a bar that appears at the top, but it won't work unless you've got some elements in there, specifically a phone number. So if I go like that and I go publish, you'll see that that top menu, oh, I've got to reload it. It would be good if it was live. Oh, there you go. So there's my top. This is called a secondary menu. Now, unfortunately, uh, in Divi, it doesn't really have um, very many options. You can put an email, phone, um, and you can put your, your icons, which um, is going a bit weird. No, I don't want to do that. Now, I'm going to show you how to do um, a custom header. So I'd recommend that you'd create a Divi uh, custom header if you wanted that secondary menu anyway, if that makes sense. I'll show you in a little bit. Um, okay, so fixed navigation settings are when you scroll. See how it's, it's, it's changed the height? So, it's, so this is the primary navigation, but when it goes like this, it's called the fixed navigation. The reason that it's important is you may want to change the color. So maybe you have a really, uh, really clear when you first come to a website, but when you scroll, you might change the colors for your aesthetics or something like that. Or in this case, make it smaller. If you want it to not shrink like that, and most of the time, so what you do is you come to your primary menu bar and you go, what's the height? 66. Then we can jump down to our fixed navigation. We can make that 66. And then what happens is that, yeah, see how it stopped uh, shrinking? Um, but the settings in here should make sense to you. Background color, color of your navigation links, drop downs, that sort of thing. Um, so that should all make sense. Or you can make it full width. So I'll jump to the full width there. All right, so you can jump into that in your own time. Um, footer. Now the Divi footer sucks. So I recommend you just build your own footer. Um, we'll just leave it at that. So you don't need this section. 
uh, buttons. So what this will do is this will do a global style for your buttons. That's really useful. You can put your font, your color, um, icon, whatever. Uh, and so at that point, um, when you add a new button in the Divi um, module, then it'll come with your styling. Uh, most of these other things aren't that useful. Um, so uh, I'll let you do that, go through them in your own time. This double arrow up here, this is portability. So this means that you can export these settings across to another website, which is exciting. Okay, any questions coming through? All right, that's good. It must be being clear. All right, so now I've gone through all this, the settings on building a page and the settings for global, um, doing your fonts, colors, that sort of stuff. Now, something exciting got released um, in the last, couple months in Divi, it made me really excited anyway, is the theme builder. So before that, I was hacking Divi to give us a custom um, footer, for example. So as I mentioned, the footer sucks in, in Divi. Um, so what this does is allows you to um, build um, a whole theme template. Okay, so let's do, a, let's do a footer. So there's the three sections of the website, of, of a web page. So let me add a global footer. So I'm going to build a global footer. What this will do is just bring up the Divi editor that you're used to, right? Um, well, you are if you're using it. And we're same thing with build from scratch. So I'm going to have two columns. Um, I'm going to put. Um, we're going to put uh, an image here. This is going to be a logo, and then we're going to go here. And we're going to put a. Um, a menu so therefore I might bring in a menu in the sidebar or maybe I just might um, manually do a menu okay so this is now our fancy menu generally you might want to do something fancy like you might want to do the background a, a specific color must be gaudy so I might come back here and change the text um, okay so obviously you're going to build uh, something better than I have done. As I said, I don't want to waste your time. I'm just going to quickly show you how the things work and then you can play with them. Okay, so the, the problem is you've got to actually save it a few times. First, we're going to save the actual module itself. Now, once we've done that, then we uh, close that. And now we need to save it here. What we're doing in the second save is we're saving it. The, the, in fact, we've got a global footer. Now, if I want to edit that footer, I can just come here, click it, and then I only have to save it once. So now, if I go to my web page, just a web page on this website, and I reload it, you'll see the, um, there you go, bang, there's your footer. All right, that's exciting. You're now web developers. Okay, so, we can also do that with the body. Now, I generally don't do anything with the body um, because it doesn't really make sense. Um, but let's just build a global body. Because the thing I say doesn't make sense is because you've already got the Divi Builder there. Um, I haven't actually played with this bit, so you'll need to play in your, your own time. So I assume that it allows you to um, put in sections and then the editable bit of um, Divi. Um, Let's jump back here. And I've been that. Now, a global header. This is the one case scenario where you would use the, um, the menu. So you might go one row, then we're going to use that menu, um, that menu icon, we're going to use the primary menu. There we go. So this will give you a menu just the same as if you want but there yeah, this allows just you to customize your your um, header and footer generally i leave your body alone so you've got a custom header custom footer you've got a custom website design save money on a web developer exciting so that's the theme builder you've got portability here on the right okay so now i'm going to show you the templates now this is actually really exciting as a developer as well because this is the thing we used to have to hand code so you can create a cust the same as what I just showed you, a custom layout for all pages, just for your home page, for your blog posts, categories. 
things with specific tags. Um, all your archive pages. So you might say uh, all of my um, all my blog posts that categorize this is a certain design and layout. Uh, like the amount of control that you can have now over Divi um, in building these layouts is, is pretty phenomenal. It also supports uh, custom post types. Um, if you are the last webinar, um, but here's something really interesting: a 404 and our search results. So I recommend that every 404 page and what they've done here, see how it's green? That means it's gonna be the same on every page um, template. So in this context, I can't actually um, have two different headers. I could, I could then delete that and then put another header in, right? Use the global header or I can build a custom one. So if you wanna get really funky with your 303, but that doesn't make sense because if, if they've come to the wrong page, sorry, 404, if they come to the wrong page, you want them to have the navigation. But you may want to take off the footer. And here you can then um, build a custom body. You can write your error message. You might say, oh, you know, um, page is missing. Maybe go to the home page, that sort of stuff. So 404 is a page that loads when you, um, when, when you haven't come to a page. So I'll show you an example of that. Um, so with this one, if I go to a, a non sql page, what have we got here for the commons library? What will happen if I go to a, a broken page? Bam. All right, why are they loading? Okay, so here we go. So we've programmed a search on the left and then we've written, so you can't find the resource, check out our directories, contact the librarian. So we're able to custom that. This one, I'm just being more of a smart ass. I'm just going to pages burnt. That's a fire related thing. All right. Um, where'd my discard edit? Okay. So that's the theme builder. So this is really exciting because you can customize all your pages. You can customize the header, customize the footer, you can customize the templates. Oh, you build your whole website here, right? Without having to do code. Yay, exciting. All right, so that is the, um, the Divi theme builder. Whew. So now I'm gonna just go to the role editor, which I uh, forgot to put on the run sheet, um, but I'm gonna run through it. Okay, so here's our different WordPress page roles, and we went through this um, in the, um, the WordPress fundamentalists. If you didn't go to that webinar, basically you can set up your different website users as different um, roles, different powers. So for example, an editor, you may um, switch off the theme builder. That means that they can't actually edit the header or the footer. Makes sense, right? Because you just don't want any rando doing that. Um, but you may switch off the page options. You may switch off various things. So there's certain things you can turn on and off. Um, if you want to be really, uh, if you've got specific control, you can actually also turn off um, modules. So like portfolio, I'm not using portfolio. I may switch it off. I hate sliders. So I might just come in and switch them off and they go, can we add a slider? I go, oh, Divi doesn't know how to do that. Um, and they can't do it. So that's your role editor. Um, I don't use it. Generally, it's a small team that I'm training that can use stuff. But obviously, if you're a bigger team, then that's useful. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about the Divi library and Divi library is also a very exciting thing about Divi. There was nothing in here, so let's jump to a page so I can show you something. All right, so just say that I've got this section, this section here and it's wonderful. I can now click on this button here. Oh, not with my Wacom, it gets upset. Here we go. I'm gonna add it to the library. So I'm gonna call it um, red section. Generally name things that make sense. Um, if you've got a lot of um, uh, library items, you can actually make it um, categories. Okay, now global. There's two types of library items. One is a global and non-global. What global does, if you've got four um, instances of the library item, so on four different pages, you've brought in the library item. So there's four, four versions of it. If you edit one of them and it's global, you update all of them. If you, uh, if it's not global, you update one of them and the other three stay the way they were. Okay, so I'm gonna make it global. So now, 
we'll let that load. So now when I'm rolling over, see how it's gone green? Right, it used to be blue, it's now green. So what that means is, is that it's a global item. So if I had to make a change to this, and you'll notice that this is a section. So also the row and the, um, the module now is all part of that library item. You can make anything a library item. So in this context, I'm just going to make a pa the page title. I'm going to make the page title, the actual module itself, a global item. And this is one thing that I do to actually often, if I can get to it. Uh, I'm going to put page title because generally your page title is the same across all of your websites, right? So across all of your pages, sorry. So that way um, you design the font, the color, all that stuff. And the text gets updated depending on the page title. So um, this is one that I usually use, page title. I'm going to call page title, makes sense. I make that a global item and then save to library. Okay, so now I'm going to go um, to, I'm going to create a new page, new page. Um, new page, publish, publish, new page. And then I'm going to enable the visual builder. Okay. So build from scratch. So I'm going to now go and roll over the blue bit and I'm going to add section. And then I'm going to add from library. And then there you see the red section, the one that I loaded before is now here. So I can click that. And there you go. There's my red um, section. So if I come in here and now um, change it, maybe change the date. I made a mistake on the date. We'll update it. We'll save that. Um, then I've got to click save. So now if I go to our other page, this is where I saved it. I might save this, I'm gonna save it and I'll reload it. That will magically, once we load, will have updated. There you go. Oh, hang on, no, where is it gone? There you go. There you go. There's that section. Now it's updated. It's now hello, hello. So that's how the library works. So you can you can save to the library any module, row, section, page. Now it's important though that when you're loading in a library item, you're actually loading in a uh, module or a section. So for example, if I come to my new page and I try to load in my red section here, this is a row, right? And so there is no red section because I saved that red section as a, as a section, not as a, a row. Um, it makes sense once you're using it, only a row can be a row, only a module can be a module and only a section can be a section. So if you can't find your um, library item in your library, refresh the page, if you still can't find it, just go and check that you've actually made it an actual module or row or whatever, because you'll get really confused. Um, okay, so we've got a, a row here, so I'm gonna add a row. And now I'm going to insert module, I'm gonna add from library. And here's my page title, because that's a module that I did, and then that sticks that in there. There we go, awesome. It's exciting. All right, so let's just now jump back and have a look a bit in the back end, and let's go to Divi library, and then Divi. All right, so here's our, um, our library items that I've added. That's a module section, they're both global. So I can also add them, edit them here. Start building. And I can also edit my library items here, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can do all the things, you can make them portable, you can check them on mobile, all that sort of stuff. All right, so that's the Divi library. Um, any questions about that? All right, so we've got no, um, 
Now, the thing uh, that I don't like about the Divi um, library, I'm just going to jump to here as an example. I, what I want is a graphic style library item. So what that means is, is that I can do all the customization. So for this one here, I can make the background yellow, I can make the title white and big, I can make the body copy black, black and I can make the icon blue. In this context, when I copy that module um, to the page, it's now not global, so it's fully customizable. And then if we go, oh, we want to change the font size of all the modules across the website, we can't do that. We can, e because we can either have a global, but if this was global and um, every, every um, council's got different solar electricity generation stats, so if I change that to 575 to 400, they all change to 400. So we can't use a global item in this example. If we use a non-global item, then we've got no way of updating them globally. So hopefully Divi, every time I whinge about Divi, um, they, they build in the thing, hence the Capacha we saw earlier. So I'm just putting it out there. So Divi build in a global library item for styles. So then as a graphic designer, I've got much more control over the design of, my, of the website. Okay, so um, I'm now just gonna jump to two plugins that um, Divi, uh, the company Divi um, have. So if I jump to the Divi website, we've got Bloom and we've got Monarch. I'm just gonna run you through what they do. Um, if I can get, here we go. All right, so I'm just jump to Bloom. Now what Bloom does is opt-in forms. So uh, that's a big part of us as campaigners. So if I jump down to email accounts here, I can configure all these different CRM type systems. Again, they're more aimed at uh, mainstream than um, activists. The Salesforce there, there's MailChimp is there, um, for example. And now we can also choose opt-in forms, like do we want to have, a, where do we want them? Do we want them as a widget? Um, pop-ups. A lot of people like their pop-ups. Um, okay, so here's an interesting thing though. When we choose um, what um, application we're going to use, if we scroll all the way down, we can use custom HTML form. So that means that if you're using um, Action Network, you can grab the Action Network um, form code and stick it in here. So therefore we can use the Divi uh, pop-up system and still use your custom form. So this is awesome because you can use anything in there. Uh, I had a client the other day that just had an image, which was like a special. And it's like, they wanted to pop up and they go click here to, to get your special. We literally just put a, a JPEG there with a link and it went to um, where they were going. So that's, um, you can put anything in these pop-ups. Um, or if you wanted to have a uh, email contact form using Gravity Forms and you wanted to have a capacha and make sure that the emails are saved to the WordPress database, you could then put the Gravity Forms code in there. So yeah, really powerful in that context. Now the thing that I recommend if you're using a pop-up to use this one is that it's built by the same company as Divi. So you're less likely to get any conflicts with any of the scripts and things like that. Um, yeah, all right, so you can have some design if you want. Um, they'll let you have layouts and designs and colors and things. Um, I usually use the technique I showed you before, so I haven't actually played with this one. Now settings. So if you go to a um, donate page and you pop up a sign up to the newsletter, that is stupid. <laughs> You've got them at the donate page, they're about to donate and you pop up a stupid newsletter thing like, so you really want to think about how you're going to pop up things and when and, and whatever. There've been so many times when you've um, been at a web page and um, you're, you're getting into it and they pop it up. So uh, you've got all these options. Think about when you're going to pop it up. Generally, I, I think it's better when um, they leave the page or if they've got to the bottom of the page. At that point, you know you've got their uh, interest. Um, they finish that page. It's less annoying. You can pop it up then. Um, and here we can exclude pages. So exclude your donation page, for example. You'd also want to exclude your contact page because you don't want popping up for newsletter when they're trying to contact you, those sort of things. So pay attention to that. Okay, so the other uh, one is they've hidden it under tools, which is Monarch settings. This is your social media share buttons. 
you know, share to Facebook, share to Instagram, that sort of thing. Whenever a client asks me to install one of these, I ask them, have you ever clicked on one of them? Have you ever shared to Facebook through one of them buttons? I've never yet heard of anyone that does it. Um, I think they're useful because it reminds people to do it. But if I'm going to share something to Facebook, I'm going to cut the link and then I'm going to put a rant on it, my own rant on Facebook, and then I'm going to share it that way. So I, I actually don't think they're that effective. It'll be interesting to see the stats because I haven't actually done the research on this one. Um, but if you do want to have share this on Facebook, share this on Twitter, this is what this tool will do it for you. So there's your networks that you can, um, you can add. Um, they've got a bit of a list there. You, and then where does it appear on your sidebar? You've got some things here, pop-ups, that sort of thing. Then you also you can add your social media following. So this is your Facebook, your um, Twitter, that, et cetera. In saying that though, the uh, page builder has a module for social networks. So this will allow you to do your social networks um, and your share on media, et cetera. Now, just a, a word about um, the share on Facebook pages. Generally, they come with tracking codes. So if you install um, a software that um, does share to social media, it's usually got tracking codes. There's heaps of companies that build big trackers and buy and sell data. So um, just bear that in mind when you're adding those tools to websites because the, it is a privacy issue. And if you are using those tools, it should go on your privacy policy. All right, so in the last seven minutes, um, so this is a Divi, um, a, a crash rush course through Divi. I'm just going to show you some some little advanced thingies um, just to um, show you how to, if, if all those Divi settings don't make you happy, then I'll show you how to go to the next level quickly. Um, and um, I do at times, can't do that. I mean, there's things that I want to do that um, Divi can't. Uh, actually, I need to do this in Chrome because my thing's broken. And Okay, so CSS is, is the language that controls the layout and colors and fonts. So if you want to find out what a font is on a website, what we do is we come here and we're going to right mouse click and we're going to go inspect. And this just popped up on my other window, so I'll bring this back. So it's going to bring this scary looking window, but don't be scared of it. This is the HTML code here. You can see I'm rolling over, it's highlighting certain things. So right here, and then it's saying what the CSS that controls it. So here we've got the H1, the color is this blue. So now I know what color it is. So also if I scroll down, here we go, the font family is Ubuntu. So if you want to, uh, if you see a website and you love their font, you can just go and figure it out and rip it off. Also, if you're trying to work out like, is it padding or, um, uh, margins we talked about it before so you can see here if I roll here see how the um, the orange is pad is margin and the green is padding so if I click on that you can actually see it here so it's like margin 27 pixels padding so if I couldn't figure it out on um, Divi I could come here get the setting and go oh it's on the and see how it says ET uh, row so this is telling me that there's 27 pixels padding on the um, top and bottom of the row. So if, I want to, if I'm figuring out how to do this in Divi, I can then go to the row, go to padding, find where it says 27. If, it's, if there's no setting, then put one in and see what happens. Um, so this allows you to deconstruct your web, like websites a little bit. So I'm, I'm just giving you an introduction here. Um, this is, a, I, I'm in this screen a lot as a developer and I'm, I'm fiddling and playing with this, um, customizing things. So this is a whole workshop on its own. Um, I may run, I may run one. Um, I have run them in the past, advanced templating and CSS and stuff. So we'll see. Um, I just want to introduce you to this concept. Okay, so I'm going to then um, show you. Just say you wanted to change the color. Now I'm going to do H2 actually, because H2 in Divi settings don't, they don't allow you to change the color of subheadings. Of all the settings of Divi, they let you change the, all the headers. All the headers are blue. They won't let me change the color of, have a different color for heading one and a different color for heading two. Okay, so come on Divi, get that setting. So this is how I'm gonna do it. So if I look at it here, I've got the style. 
and it's saying heading one, heading two, heading three, heading four, five, six is color blue. So I'm going to copy that and I'm going to copy it. Then I'm going to jump to my Divi where theme options. I'm going to jump down. I'm in the wrong website. That's not going to help. I'm not even logged into that website. Apologies. Let me find that website. I'm going to jump to the right website. Um, and then I'm going to go to Divi theme options. Sorry, this should be a little slower because um, of the zoom. Okay, I'm going to scroll down. This is where the CSS is. So this is how much CSS, for example, that I've got on um, Action Skills website. You'll notice that it's a minimal website, so I'm doing it a bit. Um, and I'm gonna go down the bottom and then I'm gonna paste in this bit of code. So at the moment it's saying all those headers are gonna be this color. I'm targeting the heading two, so I'm gonna delete that, delete that. So now I'm gonna say the heading two is that color. So I'm gonna change that color to black. One, two, uh, if I can code it correctly, one, two, three. Now, if you don't know your colors, that's fine. You could just do a quick uh, um, internet search for um, hex color or Photoshop will do it, whatever. Um, this is just a quick intro, so. Um, okay, so now if I hit reload, see how my heading two has gone black, bam. Okay, so that's just a quick introduction to how to override um, CSS. Also, if there's settings in Divi that won't let you do what you want, then that's next level. I want to show you one more thing that's, um, that's useful. And uh, on the run sheet, if I scroll down, I've got this little bit of code for you. And that's this one, display none. Okay, let's, I'm going to show you what this does. So just say I'm bringing in an action network form specifically is a good example and they've got their logo on it and I don't want their logo on it um, so what I can do is I can then um, jump I'll jump back to Chrome I can then uh, use this tool I can find out what style controls it so in this case I'd probably look for a wrapper so in this case I might jump to here and then grab that class so say it's our logo and I'll jump back to here but I'm going to do that header two sorry for the live site and i'm going to save that now if you're caching your website you may need to clear your cache and see how all my headings heading twos have just um disappeared oh no they haven't hang on heading two so that style's not coming in, so I'm going to clear my cache. I'm going to go to through caches in the next webinar. Uh, and that hasn't done it. All right. Let me work out why. Let me pull it on this one. So I made it go black. Okay, so what's happening is that there's an override. So we got a solution for that. Um, if I can get back to my dashboard, TV theme options. Down here. Okay, H2. So here we go. I've got an error. I've actually written an error in the code. I made it a class instead of a um, HTML element. Again, I'm not going to go into this much detail. I'm just showing you the trick so that in your own time, if you want to. Um, follow the trick you can do the thing there you go so now anything that's a h2 is deleted and disappeared there's the magic i'm now just going to turn that off because i actually want my headers and i don't want them black but anyway that's that's an introduction to overriding things with css uh and you can do all sorts of exciting things with that specifically you can do all the things that you can't that Divi won't let you do which isn't much but anyway cool all right, so um, I run these webinars um, as pay as you feel. Um, so on the email I sent out, uh, or the donate button on the action skills, you can donate some money, it would be much appreciated. Um, if that's not appropriate for where you're at, um, I, I really want these to be accessible. So uh, it would be really appreciative if you could jump onto my social media, like my Facebook and leave a review. 
or you share my content, like my videos, that sort of thing is really, really helpful and be really appreciated. All right, yeah, have a good uh, weekend and I'll see you on Wednesday.